Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorr and I used to identify as an introvert for the longest time and uh, over time of course that view of myself has changed as I've learned more about what extroversion really is and I think a lot of extroverts have the wrong idea about what extroversion is and I think a lot of introverts have the wrong idea about what extroversion is. And in today's video we're going to be discussing some of the reasons why you might think you're an introvert when you're actually an extrovert and how you can know whether you're an extrovert or not. Now, the five reasons why I would say that I identified with, as an introvert were, well, first and foremost, uh, I took the MBTI test after I just had a burnout. So during the time I was more depressed and I was in a more secluded and isolated time of my life. I had a lot less friends than I used to and I spent a lot of more time by myself. Because I was depressed, I would isolate from other people and I would find it hard to connect with others and I would often keep my distance from other people. Now, there are other factors that can factor in here. For example, you can be an extrovert that grows up in a very introverted culture. Growing up in northern Sweden, I was always taught that introversion was, uh, you know, the norm and extroversion was a weird thing. So if I would go up and strike up a conversation with people, people would always call me out and say, that's really weird and you don't do that. You don't talk to people. And uh, why are you talking to that guy? And why are you doing this? And why are you acting this way? Right? So I constantly had this idea in northern Sweden that, you know, I am weird. I don't fit in here. I have this, uh, I am too uh, positive, too enthusiastic, I have too much energy, and I'm too curious about other people. So uh, because of that, you know, uh, especially in my teenage years, when you want to fit in the most, you know, I uh, adopted this hyper introverted lifestyle. So I withdrew into books and fiction and uh, video games and other things and spent a lot less time hanging out with other people even though I had a natural social inclination and was naturally curious about other people I thought to myself that you know uh, uh, I uh, first and foremost feel uh, like every time I talk to people people make me feel like I'm a weirdo for doing it so maybe I shouldn't do it right so it was a way of like uh, uh, yeah trying to fit in, I guess, <laughs> in the weirdest way. Now, a third reason why I struggled to uh, fit in with the extroverted stereotype was because I had a specific form of extroversion, right? So you can be extroverted in multiple ways. And for me, I was extroverted in the way that I loved intelligent conversations and discussions with others. I loved the back and forth of throwing out ideas with other people and having interesting conversations where you get a chance to learn something. But I was not very athletic. I was not very interested in sports. I was not the person that loved to go to parties. In fact, I found parties kind of overwhelming and sensory stressful. Um, I identified as a highly sensitive person and I felt I needed that I would easily get drained or overwhelmed in social settings. And um, yeah, I also recognized uh, this was part four and that I had uh, very high expectations on myself socially, which felt like when I was in social situations, I thought I had to be the funniest person. I had to be the most active. I had to be the most interesting. I had to be the most entertaining towards other people and I had to be really nice and attentive to everyone and I had to always look out for everyone, right? So because I often took that role of being the community organizer or event manager or host, I would often get and experience social situations as draining and a lot of the time traditional ideas are that extroverts are supposed to find social settings energizing, right? And while I certainly find extroverted settings stimulating, I can still find them draining. And the distinction here is that it's stimulating in the sense that it's fun and I enjoy it, but it's draining in the sense that it takes energy and effort to uh, remember everyone's names, to keep up with everyone, to uh, you know, get to know everyone, to make a good impression on everyone, and to you know, be funny and engaging and interesting with everyone you talk to. You know? So it's certainly an act of effort. And uh, here, you know, uh, it's important to get your alone time and to think about things, right? And um, yeah, like... Uh, that's part number five. A lot of the time the idea is if you're extroverted, you're not 
very introverted, right? So you can't be both at the same time. So because we tend to have a dichotomic way of looking at things, it's often that if you're an extrovert, uh, you struggle to be alone. And if you're an introvert, you struggle to be around other people. But we know today that there are introverts that can be very extroverted and that there are extroverts that can be fairly introverted. And here, what we'll see is that, you know, for me, I had absolutely no problem being alone. I love to go on long walks by myself. I love to read. I loved a lot of introverted hobbies. I would often go out fishing or just uh, spend time by myself, just throwing out the hook and back and forth for hours, you know. And for me, like these kinds of, you know, uh, small times by myself were incredibly refreshing and energizing. And when I was alone, I thought a lot. I had so many ideas and uh, my head would start spinning around and I would think a lot, right? So for me, it was very important. And after that, I'd come back to the surface and I'd, you know, reach out to people and I'd tell everyone what I'd discovered and thought about during those times. Like I'd write a lot and, you know, come up with a lot of ideas. And uh, for me, you know, like, being out in the rural areas of northern Sweden, I would go sit by the campfire by myself, just look into the fire, or I'd walk around in the snow and, you know, just look up at the dark sky or just dream myself away. And that was such an easy thing to do. And so here are five reasons why I thought I was an extrovert and, um, well, rather why I thought I was an introvert. And I'm curious, um, what were some reasons why you thought you were an introvert? And here, I want to move forward a little bit and that's to talk about what extroversion really is and how do you know you're an extrovert and you know doesn't this all mean that I'm an introvert you know after having so many things you know doesn't that just mean I'm introverted right well the first sign that you're an extrovert is that you do things faster you make decisions more quickly you're less worried about making mistakes you have a lower error sensitivity Perhaps you're a bit sloppy, right? You rush into things, you go very quickly into things, you uh, jump into situations, and sometimes you make a few mistakes as you go, right? Because the truth is extroverts tend to live at a faster pace of life. Having a faster pace of life, though, might mean that sometimes you crash, sometimes you overextend yourself, you push things too far, you go too fast, and uh, you end up getting exhausted. And so extroverts are often people that live a little bit like sprint runners. They are very engaging and very funny and very charming and very outgoing. And after that, you know, they might get burnt out because they are always in a rush and always trying to do so many things and taking on so many projects. And after a while, it's just tiring, you know, and uh, that's completely normal. So you'll notice the energy cycle of an extrovert is a lot more, you know, and then stop and then grind to a halt and then lick your wounds for a bit think about all the things that you made wrong and should have done differently and then learn and then you keep going right so often when we look at extroverted people they've done more they've been to more places they've uh, been more active they've uh, done a lot of things but they maybe sometimes contradicted themselves maybe sometimes they've you know uh, stepped on a few eggs maybe they've done and said some things they shouldn't have because they spoke without thinking or they got too engaged or too excited about something and so on right like and that's the natural flow of the extroverted life right now i would say that uh, you could say that there are two kinds of extroverts and i would say that you know the typical extrovert is naturally very spontaneous, right? So, which means that they're very playful, right? So when you throw something at an extrovert, they'll pick it up and they'll throw something back to you and good fun and spar with you, right? So, which means that they will always meet you at your level, right? So typically, if you talk to them about the weather, they'll respond back about the weather and make it fun somehow. But uh, there is this like back and forthness of playfulness of all of this, right? Like uh, typically they are going to pick up on what you say and respond in a relevant way, right? What they are going to tell you is going to be relevant to what you told them. So if you ask them a question, it's going to be, you know, this kind of relevant back and forth of like, because you said this, I would did that. And because you said that after, I did that after, right? Uh, and this is very different from the introverted style, which is typically more likely to be a monologue, right? So the introvert will spend time by themselves, think of what they want to say, weigh their words carefully and how they want to say it. And then they'll go up to you and then they'll tell you that. And if you tell them something back, perhaps they'll need more time to process it. They'll be more serious, more 
uh, you know, what do they mean? Like, uh, why, what, why, uh, how do I understand that? And how do I interpret that? And, you know, they might take longer to ponder on what you said. And so they might seem a little bit less playful in the sense that they'll be more serious in how they respond to things. And um, a lot less spontaneous and a lot less adaptable and flexible, right? Because in a conversation, you have this two-way discussion, it's right. And I thought of this, and then I said that, and then this happened, and then that happened, right? Uh, but often in the introverted dialogue, often what you hear is, you know, they'll talk for a longer time, and they'll ask less questions, and it will be less like a conversation and more like a one-way monologue. And uh, then the other person has their monologue, and then there's this more slow and more careful back and forth between the two, right? So you see high levels of dynamicity, speed, but also high levels of playfulness in the extroverted dominant type, right? And you'll see that there are typically two kinds of ambiverts too. Like uh, typically when a person is more judging, they might be very proactive, they might be very busy, they might be very hardworking. And because of that, they might be more outgoing. They might take more initiatives, start up projects, you know, get things in motion, set up ideas, put things out to the world, right? And this is, of course, very extroverted, but because uh, they are so strong in their judging personality trait, because they score so high in that, they will probably also spend more time planning and organizing and weighing before they do that. So it's uh, you know, a cycle, an energy cycle, where it's like first you plan and think, and then you go out, and then you make a lot of decisions in a very rapid amount of time, right? So first plan, and then go to action. And... Uh, on the other side of that, you have another kind of ambivert. You have the perceiving type. So those that score very strongly in perceiving relative to their extroversion and introversion tend to be relatively ambiverted. So what you see there is kind of the opposite cycle. So typically the perceiving type will, you know, be very spontaneous and be very flexible and they'll, you know, be very playful and very open to whatever happens and go with the flow of a situation. But after they've done that, they might retreat to process everything, you know. Uh, wait, what did I actually mean with that? And how can I understand that? And is this really right? And is this really what I want? And is this really the right decision, right? So there is this, you know, you go out, you experiment a bit, throw a few things out there, play with uh, around with some things. And after that, it's uh, an analytical process of going like, hmm, wait, was this what I wanted? Was this really something I enjoyed? Was this really fun for me, you know, like, was this really the thing I want to do? So here's what you kind of notice, like, because these temperaments are like, the judging and perceiving temperaments are so kind of in between and borrow on some extroverted traits and some introverted traits, they are fairly ambiverted uh, relative to the person that scores primarily in extroversion, which is super extroverted, very dynamic, very playful, very active, right? Now, you might want to think about objective and cultural extroversion versus, you know, relative personal extroversion, right? So, a lot of the time when we decide if we're introverted or extroverted, we kind of have to look at things outside of our dominant culture. We kind of have to look at things on a bell curve, right? So, when we are measuring personality, we have to look and compare ourselves across people and society as a whole, right? Because, yeah, you're going to encounter people that are more extroverted than you, people that are more outgoing, people that make decisions more quickly, people that are more active, people that are more playful and more enthusiastic and more energy than you. And that's not necessarily a reason to doubt that you're extroverted. It just means that, you know, on the bell curve, they're slightly above you, you know, they might be in the top percentile and you might be in the top 10 percentile, right? So here's the thing, you're still an extrovert. It's just that, you know, yeah, there's always going to be people that are more extroverted than you. And so it's so important to have perspective when you compare yourself. And so you might want to, instead of comparing yourself to one extrovert and one introvert, you might want to compare yourself to 10 people, right? And uh, one person is very introvert and one that's very extrovert and so on. And you might see uh, relative to these 10 people, I'm kind of, you know, Charlie level extroverted, right? Because Charlie is also kind of like me, you know, we're both, you know, quite en energetic and quite fun, but, you know, we also tend to be a bit more mellowed out sometimes and, you know, so on, right? So you notice this also in tempo, you know, when you meet somebody, you notice that the other person is way more enthusiastic, way more energetic, way more like engaged in the conversation. 
and uh, you yourself, you find it hard to keep up, right? Or you might be in a conversation with a person who is way slower than you, right? And you're very quick and you talk fast and you're like very energetic and they are much more calm, much more controlled, much more poised. And, you know, you're trying to talk with them and they're like, yeah, I don't know. I will see. And first, it's there's not a lot of energy in there and it's very controlled and it's very cognitive and it's the tricky part of it, right? Because, yeah, not... Uh, Everyone is super extroverted and when they're not, they're often more cautious, they have a higher level of error sensitivity, they're more controlled, they make fewer mistakes, they're um, usually much more seriously inclined, they're usually more organized, they, pl they plan and th their thoughts out in advance, and if they don't have a plan, you know, they might be less energized. You can also see this in a sense of, you know, yeah, this person might seem super extroverted, but only because they spent a long time early preparing for it, right? Like that was the case of the judging type, right? So, uh, and this can even to some extent be the case for a very introverted person, because a, even a very introverted person can have a specific area, a specific topic, a specific situation where, <coughs> where they can be quite extroverted and quite outgoing. And, um, you know, a person can seem like they're very open-minded when you talk to them and they can seem very fun and very playful, you know, uh, when you first meet them. And then, uh, you know, when you start to try to meet up with them again, they might be more hesitant. I don't know, I don't feel like it. I'm kind of tired. I'm kind of like thinking about something kind of, you know, in this process. And that can also be the case with the perceiving type because you can see that the perceiving type, you know, uh, while they, in the situation or in the moment, can be very open-minded to a lot of things and people, you know, uh, because they learn so much, because they're so, you know, open-minded, they need a lot of time by themselves to process. And, uh, yeah, they're also a bit more careful to commit to things, to, you know, uh, connect with other people and so on, uh, because they are, they try to be a bit more open-ended, in a sense, in how they deal with things. And they only commit when they know, like, this person is a person I want to hang out with, and this person is somebody I can consider a friend, and so on, right? So, yeah. And that's the spectrum of introversion and extroversion, really. The, you have the top introverts, you have the judges and perceivers in the middle, and you have the extroverts. And you can find out that, hey, maybe I'm kind of in between the two. Maybe I'm a judger or a perceiver dominant type with only a mild preference for extroversion or a mild preference for introversion. And that's completely normal. And you don't have to feel forced to fit yourself in all of the dichotomies and have a perfect position in all of them. It's completely fine to be more neutral on certain scales while having very strong preferences in others. Remember, we only have one dominant function. And <laughs> yeah, the others can be more supportive and more situational and more context bound, right? So that's key. Um, thank you so much for watching and see you all in the next video.